Good evening, church family. Will you please stand up? Let's sing There's Something About That Name. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim, kings and kingdoms will something about that name. Our first hymn is number 58. Isaiah 9 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Let's bow for our opening prayer, please. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house, Lord, tonight, and Father, to learn more about um, our enemy. Father, how to recognize him, and Father, to know what he is up to on a daily basis. Father, I pray you'd speak through Dr. Cliff tonight. 
Father, I pray that we would have our eyes and ears open to hear what you have to say. Father, I pray you continue to watch him over and protect us and forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 65. You already said the... Yeah, okay. seated. If you'll turn tonight to Ephesians, am I on? Ephesians chapter 6. I'll come back to that in a moment. We've been looking at the reality of Satan, who he is, what he does. We've looked at the names and names, again, in the Bible are very instructive of what a person is and what he does. The tragedy in a lot of churches tonight is simply we dismiss him as irrelevant, may not believe him at it all, and we don't think we're involved in it. So we left off last week by looking at Jesus starting to teach in parables. It's instructive, again, when you begin to see why our Lord shift in his manner of teaching. And his disciples were so puzzled by that, they asked him, why are you now teaching in parables? Some of that is hard to understand. And Jesus told them why. There was a point in time in the life of the nation of Israel when they attributed the work of Christ to Satan. I'm trying to tie this together to Satan. You're casting out demons by Satan's power. And the moment they did that, our Lord said, you have committed an unpardonable sin. You'll never be forgiven. And I'm fixing to get to some of us may be shocked when I get to this in a moment. I'm so tired of us depending on emotions and feelings and opinions. Facebook, Internet. No wonder we have such a shallow misunderstanding of the Bible. 
And Jesus explained to them, this is why I am teaching in parables, so that those who have crossed that line can hear, but they're not going to understand. They're not going to respond. And then he began to tell the parable of the soils. Some call it the parable of the sower. That's not the theme. The, the issue is soils. So when you sit and hear the word of God, what kind of soil are you? That seed is falling on soil. That's, I don't have a garden, but anybody that does or plants flowers, you put seed in the ground. And our Lord began to explain the four kinds of soil and why people respond or don't respond the way they do to the Word of God. You can, have you ever sat down and calculated how many hours in your lifetime you have heard sermons? Whether it's in person, in a Sunday school class, on television, on radio, how often you have heard the Word of God. What happens to all of that? Why do people respond the way they respond? And our Lord said it's because of the kind of soil. And then after he explained that, he said, after a man had planted his field, in the cover of darkness, the evil one came and sowed tares. And this is where it gets interesting. The tares are sown in the world, not the church. And he makes that plain. The problem is, you cannot tell the difference in a tear and a wheat until it reaches maturity. And when the farmer realized what had happened, an enemy has done this. This is how in that culture they would get back at people they didn't like. They'd sow the tares. And you thought you've got a bumper crop coming in. And you couldn't tell the difference. The wheat and the tare grow together, and then one day when it's time to mature, it doesn't mature. The tare doesn't. So, so listen to me very carefully. The re here's the difference in wheat and tare. Besides the tare not having a personal relationship to Jesus, you'll never get spiritual ministry nor fruit out of a tear. They come to church. They sit in the pews. They profess to be believers. They belong to the church. And they may go through a lot of different activity, but they never produce spiritual fruit. Never. And there's going to be a day Jesus said, you leave them alone. I'll take care of the tares. And you remember how he closed out the Sermon on the Mount. I'm, I'm trying to put all this together as we come now to spiritual warfare before I get there. I want to remind you about the soil and the seeds. There will be a day when people stand before me, and I'm going to look at them and say, I don't know you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. But, Lord, didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do all these works in your name? And Jesus said, yes, but I don't know you. You don't have a personal relationship with me. You're a tear. That's the activity of Satan today. And I don't know how to make this any plainer. He is a merciless, incorrigible, depraved, wicked enemy of God, the church, Christ, and Christians. He's incorrigible. He'll never change. And his one priority is to destroy your walk and your witness, to demolish the church and the unity of the body of Christ. Wow. So that brings us to spiritual warfare. We've looked at the personality of him and the names that deprive how he operates and what he does. So how do I combat that? How do I confront Satan? And I'm tired of hearing people say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Now, you're going to have to listen to me very carefully, folks. You can hear all sort of things on television. You can hear it 
on whatever you watch on social media. The warfare is real, and you don't need to doubt whether or not it is. But there's so much confusion and so much controversy in this subject of spiritual warfare and demons and demonology and the activity of Satan and the devil. And much of the confusion and the controversy comes from not knowing the word of God. I don't have any freedom to step outside the boundaries of what is revealed to me in Scripture. So you have opinions, you have discussions, you'll have sermons that are not biblically based. The only true trustworthy source for coming to a conclusion and an understanding about Satan and warfare and demonic activity is rooted in the grounded in Scripture. And when I come to the biblical doctrine about the fallen world of darkness and deception and Satan and what demons do, that deserves much more careful study than most of us are willing to give to it. I don't believe in coincidence as a Christian. I, I was not aware. I didn't know Ron Alexander was coming this morning. I led Ron to the Lord. He was a, a church member, raised in a Baptist church. His dad is a deacon today, and he was as lost as this piece of tin. And when God saved Ron, gloriously changed him inside and out. So much so, his wife walked off and left him. I want you to hear me very well this morning, tonight, folks. Ron's not a preacher. I discipled him for two years along with 11 other people. And Ron is one of the most committed disciple makers I have ever encountered in my life. He lives and breathes discipleship. So he was telling this morning after church, and they... He and his wife, uh, he a, was a med tech, he's retired. His wife was a, a very educated nurse, and she's retired, and they're living in Pensacola now. He said, the most amazing thing happened, and wherever Ron goes, somebody, God's going to bring somebody to his doorstep. So the other day, a street over, there was a house had the same number as ours. We're just on a different street. And a man showed up at my house and said, uh, did by chance UPS leave a package for you at your house? And Ron said, no, did not. Well, he said he didn't leave it at mine, and it was due, and I just wondered we had the same number. Maybe he got the wrong street. And Ron said, no, did not. Well, Ron's wife still had up a lot of decorations, and there was Christ and Jesus and he looked at all of that, and he said, are you, a, are you a believer? And Ron said, yes, I am a believer. Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? And he said, yes, I am. And he gave him the name of the church. Now, listen, this is what's so sad. I was saved when I was 18 years old. I am 65 years old, and I still don't know what God's plan is for my life. Ron said, would you like to know? And the man said, I sure would. And so now Ron has added another one to his discipleship group. Isn't that sad? From 18 to 65. So tonight, when we started the church, and we were a little later leaving, trying to fool with a dog, and then I realized when I walked out my garage, I looked up and there was a man that I know. In fact, he was one of the first ones to meet Friday as Lori was training him. He's a member of a church out in West Shreveport, drives a school bus. I don't know if he's a deacon out there or not. 
So he said, I'm glad you came out. Could I ask you a question? I said, certainly you can, Dan. He said, I struggle in my prayer life. And I'm not making fun of him because he was as sincere as the concrete he was standing on. And I'm trying to put together about this praying, the Father, the Son, and Jesus Christ. And and I went through that with him. And he said, by the way, do you, do you ever read a man by the name of Oswald Chambers? I said, I sure do. I'm reading him right now, Dan. And, and when I got in the car and drove away, I, I thought to myself, you know, again, what has bothered me over the last year, probably, that I have not grounded us enough in the word of God because it doesn't seem to stick. And when it comes to spirit, and, you know, I thought when I drove away, it, isn't that sad that so many people, and I don't mind people asking questions. I'd rather them do that and get clarification rather than just stumbling on in, in blindness and not understanding and ignorance. I don't believe in coincidence. I, I was delayed for a reason. He has a little rescue dog. That's the cutest little dog. And he was out walking that dog. What is it I need to know? And I don't, I don't know how to be any more serious, but this is not a game we're playing. And you can look at what is openly happening in this country. And I just, you, you just shake your head. You can't make this stuff up. We have literally gone off the rails in the government that we have. And they are absolutely becoming a dictatorship with no resistance whatsoever because we have allowed that. And for me to talk to a deputy sheriff yesterday and and tell him the reason you're wearing the gun and, and being a deputy is because of a sin nature. And we want to make everything about politics or about race. It's not that. Sin nature. It's a sin nature. And the enemy is real. So when I'm coming to study Satan and his activity... It deserves more careful study than most believers have given it. I don't seem to understand how Satan operates, his, his method, his strategies. And there are gaping holes in our defenses because we don't understand how to confront him. I have to understand what he does and how I meet him head on how do I proceed in that warfare in fighting the good fight of faith as one writer put it the woeful lack of teaching and preaching on the subject of spiritual warfare during the last 50 years is in itself a testimony to the cleverness of the wiles of the devil so I want to tell you tonight as clearly as I know how folks your emphasis and belief on spiritual warfare must have a biblical foundation. Don't go grab something out of the air or listen to some of these name it and claim it miracle working preachers telling you what you need to do and rebuke him and do this and do that. Our subjective feelings, our emotional desires, our fervent sincerity are not effective weapons against Satan. It will never hold up. And we don't seem to understand. Satan never yields ground, ground to my emotions, my sincerity. He's not afraid of that. He only retreats before the authority of God and the word and the believer that stands in that. So, for instance, and when I get, I, I, I'm going to start on this at somewhere to coincide with it. How many of you understand your identification with Jesus tonight? Your position. That's how you fight is from that position. 
And you can pray this prayer. Father, thank you that I fight from the victory. I don't fight for it. The victory has already been won. But we don't understand our position in him. We don't understand our identification with him. We have feelings and emotions and desires, and the fervency of them sometimes is overwhelming. Wow. And the defeat or victory over the enemy is going to depend on the word of God, not you, uh, not your emotions, not your feelings. So I want to challenge you to think this through, folks. That's why I'm talking, it was talking the last few Sunday mornings about our great salvation. It's not just going to heaven when you die. I'm glad to know that I will go to heaven when I die. If I don't, if Jesus tarries coming for the church. But that's not why God saved you, not why he saved us. And we don't seem to understand that. When an individual becomes a believer, put their faith, puts their faith and trust in Christ, my relationship, your relationship to everything around me changes. Sadly, some of us never change. We just go right on doing the same old things. We never understand that we have a new creation. All things have become new, and they are continually to become new. I am now a citizen of heaven. I am in God's family. He's my heavenly father. And now because I have a new relationship to God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, I will become the object of attack from Satan. Count on it. And I've been sitting and thinking about that this past week. Where he has attacked the refuge is unbelievable. And some of us never even are aware of it. Never. We're in his crosshairs, I can assure you of that. We're facing the same enemy that opposed Jesus who took him off into the wilderness for 40 days. If he did Jesus that way, (laughs) why would you think you're going to be exempt from any of that? It's not a figment of imagination unless you think this is a fairy tale or it's just a good book and he's a good man. That's why we must know the truth. We are involved in warfare, whether we realize it or not. And the warfare is real and intense. And the tragedy is some of us never understand the nature of it. But the scriptures are very clear about the spiritual war that you and I are a part of and tells us about the enemy and what I need to understand to be able to confront him. So it's, it's sort of strange if you study the book of Ephesians. It's an encyclical letter. It meant it was written to all churches. And some theologians and scholars think next to Romans and maybe above Romans, Ephesians is the greatest book Paul ever wrote. Wow. You want to know what Ephesians is about? It's a treatise on the church. The church. And he begins to describe the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the spiritual building, and a church that is the object of Satan's hatred and opposition. Why do we treat the church so lightly when Paul has devoted an entire book in the New Testament to the church and the importance of the church? And it's sort of strange as you work your way through the book of Ephesians. In first three chapters, Paul begins to describe our position in Christ. We've been made to sit in the heavenlies. The marvelous, majestic reality of our position in Christ Jesus and the fact that I have a rich inheritance in Christ. Wow. 
And then in chapters 4 and 5, you know what Paul turns to? Because you have been made to sit in the heavenlies, because you are in the body of Christ, you're part of the bride, walk like it. Live like it. Walk worthy of your calling. Don't call yourself a Christian and you're in and out of the body of Christ at will and you're not ministering your gift and you're not bearing witness. To Don't do that. Don't call yourself a Christian if you're not walking worthy. And he has not left us alone with that, folks. That seems like an impossible, Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Holy Spirit. What a great God we have. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He lives on the inside of us. And that's why the writers, and I keep on emphasizing, when you wake up in the morning, yield your entire being to the Holy Spirit. I don't care how you feel. It's not a matter of your feelings. This is God's will for your life to walk in the Spirit, to be controlled by the Spirit, and you can yield to Him. It doesn't matter that you feel horrible. If we ask anything according to His will, He does what we've asked Him. Well, I just don't feel like I'm... No, it's not based on your feelings. It's based on truth. He said He would answer that. He said He would control you. Now, that's the first five and a half chapters. And then in chapter 6, when you get down to verse 10, there seems to be such a shift. It's almost, how in the world did we get here? Look, verse 10 of, chapters of Ephesians, chapter 6. Listen to what he says. Finally, after understanding your position in Christ, that you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You've been redeemed by the grace of God. You're to walk worthy of that calling. Don't call yourself a Christian, and you're not walking worthy of that. And now, all of a sudden, the strangest things happen. We're in the middle of warfare. Goodness gracious. And there is a clear call to all of us to take up arms and engage in the battle. That is a result of understanding the first five chapters and being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. If I am walking worthy of my identification and my calling, I will encounter the enemy. I will. I can count on it. And that's why Paul is closing out his book with a manual on spiritual warfare. This is how the earthly ministry of Jesus began, folks, with Satan tempting him, trying to detour him away from the cross. Why would we think he would do anything less than us? And then the writers tell us, that after Jesus had confronted Satan with the word of God, he departed for a season. He didn't run away completely. He's just waiting in the bushes. I used to love, and you, you have cats, I used to love to watch our cat sit on the, the windowsill and the birds come to the feeder, and it, the, the, window was right, the feeder was right above the window, and you could see them in that crouch, and they're thinking they're going to, yeah, that's what Satan does. He lurks. He's waiting to trap you, to deceive you, and if possible, to destroy you. And I can't even imagine the battle that was going on between Satan and Jesus. It was intense. So he departed for an opportune time, Kairos. He's waiting for that little wedge in your life, folks. You miss one Sunday and you, whoops. It's easy to miss the next Sunday and the next Sunday, and I'm fixing to get to why that's important in this battle. And that little door, that little wedge has suddenly kicked open a little bit wider, and Satan is standing there lurking. 
we're not in a playground. We're in a battleground. And the intensity of it, we just don't seem to understand. How we fight and how we engage the enemy will determine my spiritual growth, my fulfilling of God's plan and will for my life, our witness to the lost. It will display the glory and the honor of God. It will manifest the power of the Holy Spirit. And we will have crowns to lay at the feet of Jesus because we were faithful to do what he called us to do. Is this not what Paul's testimony was when he came to the end of his life? Oh, after I moved to Shreveport, I, I had the opportunity of hearing a, a Jewish evangelist, Hyman Appleman, speak. And he told a story I've never forgotten. In the second the book of Timothy, the fourth chapter is Paul's life's writing before he died. And he was sort of putting that in his own commentary. The Apostle Paul is busy writing 2 Timothy. And as he's writing the book, he hears this strange scratching sound outside the cell. And it became irritating to him. And he cried out to the jailers, what is that sound? It's interrupting my study. And the jailer yelled back at him, shut up, you stupid Jew. You don't want to know. Paul picked up the pen and started to write again. And again, that scratching and that scratching. And with a note of impatience, he cries out again, what is that noise? Shut up, you stupid Jew. You don't need to know. A third time. And Paul was insistent, what is that scratching? And that Roman soldier looked at him and said, you want to know, I'm going to tell you. That's the executioner sharpening the axe that's going to take off your head tomorrow. Paul thought about that for a moment and went back to his parchments, picked up his pen, and continue to write, I have run the race. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the course. And henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Wow. There's no escaping it. And I'm not saying we're all going to lose our heads over this. At the rate we're going in this country with no pushback. I ought not to say this. Have you ever stopped to think why there's such hatred of Donald Trump? Why there is such hatred? I don't care what you think about Trump. Trump is not the issue, never was the issue. It's a smokescreen, and Satan has been very deceiving about that. And all of our attention is over here on one man. It's not about Trump. It's about this country, and people hate that man. And he's not the most moral individual in the world. I understand that. But he is the one man that was standing in the way of the present agenda to turn this country into a socialist regime. And they are relentless in that. And behind all of that is a master deceiver. I know that sounds radical, doesn't it? I, I don't know if you ever think, and I don't sit and dwell on politics. Wow. Mm. There's no escape in the warfare. There's no escaping Satan's activity. This is not a passing fad. It's not going to be gone in a few days or a few months or years. From the very moment of his rebellion in heaven, he has hated God. He has fought him every step of the way. And here is one of the mistake, the, the misunderstood truths of the book of Ephesians. And I just sometimes think, Lord, I don't even know why I continue to say this. 
the mystery of the church. The mysterion, the church was never seen in the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets didn't know about the church. But to Paul was revealed that stewardship of it, that dispensation, that age of the church. So I'm going to put this as clear as I know how, and you can deal with it. And don't tell me this is coming from the preacher, and I don't have to listen to him. If you put your faith and trust in Christ, you are also in his body. That's simultaneous. The moment you trusted Christ, the Holy Spirit placed you in the body. You can't ignore that. You cannot argue that. That's the truth. We are part of the body, the bride, the spiritual building. Now listen. And since the day of Pentecost, when the church was born, birthed, from that day until now, the church is the channel through which God works. We are his redeeming agency in a sin-darkened, Satan-dominated world. He has put the church in the midst of alien territory, in the middle of the enemy, a depraved, hostile world system where there is constant warfare and constant conflict. We're a living organism. I'm a part of that body. We are the visible expression of the head who is in heaven. And when the body malfunctions, when everybody is not in place in the body of Christ, we are weakened and we cannot do what God has ordained us to do. And when we are crippled like that, that's the picture the lost world has of Jesus. Wow. Wow. And where there is the greatest spiritual challenge, and I can tell you it's a challenge to go out into this world system today and tell people about Jesus. There will be the greatest opposition. The greatest opposition. Satan is the master deceiver. He hates God. He hates you. He hates me. And he is intent in his strategy of warfare. So I'm going to leave you with this. and You can take this home and mull over it. Why? Why did Paul put this at the end of Ephesians, this spiritual warfare manual? Why does Satan attack the church? I want you to think this through. Why does he attack the church like he does? And if you will just be very careful to rightly divide the word of God. The church is the agency commissioned in the great commission to carry the gospel so that the lost can be saved. He wants to direct our focus away from that. There are outreach ministries that we are involved here today, tonight, but there are others that we could be involved with, most definitely involved in if we just had that vision and understanding. If I were, if it was an army and the enemy wanted to do something, they would come at the supply line. That's why Satan attacks the church. He, he commissioned us to be his witnesses. The second reason he attacks the church, the unity of the body is a witness to the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're not divided. They don't have a council meeting and one day the Holy Spirit doesn't show up or somebody's not in place to minister their gifts. That is a display to the world that the church is divided, it's not united. And they don't see the love of Christ being manifested. 
I remember reading a story about uh, the Moody Church in Chicago. Dwight L. Moody was the pastor there, and there was a little boy that would walk, just walk. I don't even know how long he walked to get to that church. Every Sunday, snow, rain, hail, he never missed. And he would pass church after church after church to get to Moody's church. And one day somebody that saw that and observed it stopped him and said, Son, look at all the churches you're passing up. Why do you go that far in all of this horrible weather to get to Moody Church? And he said, because down there, they know how to love a fella. Have you ever stopped to think there's no division in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? And we're in the body, and when we're divided, that's not a witness. The third reason Satan attacks the church, the church is the instrument of, to teach and preach the gospel and the life-changing strengthening of the, of the word of God. This is our weapon, his word. And if he can detract us away from that, wow, goodness. If he can persuade us or entice us to neglect the word, or to distort the truth. He weakens the body. Now listen to me very carefully. Now next week I'll have to tell you how you confront him. And it's not the way some of us think. I've had two times in my ministry somebody has shown up. And told me they were demon possessed. Now I'll get to that. It's interesting. One of them was over at Willow Point. And I, I had Ron sit in there with me when this person came. And he was telling me about the, you know, all the demon possession he was involved in. And he came in and sat down and we talked and talked and talked. And I never one time sensed that evil. And he told me during the course of it, well, I, they're, they're here. I, they're playing on my shoulders right now. Well, I value Ron's uh, spiritual insight greatly. Ron is a, a astute student of the Word of God. And when this person left, I looked at him, and he looked at me, and he said, we both said, we, we never sensed that in that individual. Never had that happen at Waller. And, folks, we just, we just daydream through all this. We don't think that occurs. I mean, it was, you know. This was an older man. He's demon-possessed. He thought he was being attacked. And I took our youth director over to his house, and it so scared him, he, he carried his gun with him. I don't know what he thought we were going to face the demons with guns. <laughs> that would have been sad. And I walked out of that house, same thing. And I didn't have to stand there and say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, come out of this person. I'm going to deal with this. Have you ever wondered about this business of exorcism? Yeah. That's for another night. I can't, I don't have time. We face an enemy. Paul declares this, that as we get closer to the return there will be an increase in demonic activity because the world is moving to that moment in time when the Antichrist will be revealed. Wow. And we don't even see it happening around us. These are vile, vicious, malignant people that are controlled by him. I read a funny post on Facebook this week. You use that little slogan, you can't make this stuff, stuff up. And then they said, look, oh, yes, you can. ABC, NBC, CBS, C, CNN, yes, MSNBC. Yeah, you can make this stuff up because they're good at that. Because Satan controls the airwaves. I get to this. 
what what do you mean well it's in ephesians we'll get to that tune in <laughs> we'll get to that he is real i can assure you of that and he will come and let me give you one more little story and i i've talked the last few weeks many times about miss bertha smith that was one strong little lady i don't she was in her 90s when we had her at willow point yeah she was so while she was there, she got sick. We had a doctor in our church, Dr. John Clement. He was on staff at, at us, you are, uh, hospital, uh, med medical school. So I called John. He said, "How you take Miss Bertha to Shumpert. That's when Shumpert was still open over on, on Margaret Place. So I took her over there. Now, she is, was, was, as uh, Debbie said, she was feisty as you make them. The nurse came in and said, uh, Miss Smith, I need to know if you're allergic to anything. And, you know, they go through all these medicines. She looked at that nurse. She said, I'm allergic to one thing, original sin. And Satan took care of that at the cross. Uh, Jesus took care of that at the cross. And that nurse stopped writing at mid-page. She didn't know how to respond to that. When Miss Bertha got out of the hospital, she had a stroke. And I took her to the airplane. And she looked at me and she said, Dr. Cliff, Satan knocked me down this week. You think he can't do that? Of course, it's with God's permission. Satan knocked me down this week. And I could understand why. I mean, she was such a stout warrior. Find that little book, How the Spirit Filled My Life, and read it. It's well worth it. The enemy is intense. He's real. And we don't seem to even recognize him. And I'm not just up here. trying to make any of us feel good or just saying something I, I'm I am committed to the insp the sufficiency of the word of God and these two incidences tell us and me how far removed we are from solid foundation in our life and that bothers me and father have I done all I can do have, have I have I failed in laying that solid foundation? I don't want to do that. We have to back up and start over again or either him say, well, maybe somebody else needs to do that. I, I don't, it bothers me. We need to be better equipped than we are and to understand what we're involved in in this spiritual battle. It is real. It is intense. It is intense. When I first moved to Shreveport, big ad in the Shreveport Times. I mean, this was a paid ad by the deacons of a certain First Baptist Church south of here. This is to inform all of the church members that we are having a specially called business meeting on such and such a night to dismiss the pastor. And I thought to myself, oh, dear God, I'd hate to be in their shoes when they stand. And I'm not sure they'll be at the Bema seat, but they'll be at, if not, they'll be at the great white throne judgment. This is not a game here, folks. Not a game. This man sitting back over here this morning is, is my brother in Christ, my prayer warrior. Uh, he is intense in his commitment, to, and he's not a preacher. He's a retired med tech. But he is faithful. Faithful. And only God knows how many lives he's touched through the years of discipleship. 
I hope we can say with Paul, I have fought the good fight. I ran the race, and I finished the course. I like this. I think we'll just close tonight, good. Father, I, I'm asking you to honor your word tonight in our hearts because we've heard it, and I know the vessel is not sometimes the most capable but you promise that your word will not come back void open our eyes to see our minds to understand and comprehend what we need to know and to be fervent in the warfare in our own lives and in the, the life of the church. We praise you and worship you and honor you tonight for being the God that you are. Our Lord, our Savior, our refuge, our strength, our counselor, our mighty God, Prince of Peace. In the strong name of Christ we pray. Amen.